and welcome to this evening's um, Early Years Curriculum Roadshow webinar. My name is Wendy Ratcliffe, I'm one of His Majesty's Inspectors and I'm also Ofsted's Principal Officer for our Early Education Policy. That means that it's my team that are responsible for um, our Education Inspection Framework Policy um, and how we go about inspecting. And I'm really pleased that with me today are Sam and Phil. Can you both introduce yourselves, please? Thanks, Wendy. Hi, everyone. I'm Sam Sleeman Boss. I'm, I work in Wendy's team as Early Education Quality and Practice Lead, and I'm also an Early Years Regulatory Inspector. Hi, everyone. Good evening. My name is Phil Minns. I'm a senior His Majesty's Inspectors, and I work in the Curriculum Unit, focusing on um, the early years. Brilliant. OK, so colleagues, welcome to the webinar this evening. One of the things that we want to make sure that um, you get to hear is some of the messages that we've been doing through some of the road shows that we've been doing around the country. And we recognise that for childminders, it can be quite difficult to get to some of those events. We have had some on Saturdays, which some people have joined, but we wanted to make sure that you get the information as well. Hence why this evening's web webinar is um, purely for childminders. So we are in this webinar today, we are going to try and address some of the questions that you've raised ahead of um, today's session. But, and in doing that, we go, and we will leave some time at the end to answer some of the questions that come up in the chat bar. So you can see from this slide what we intend to cover in this session. So I will be handing over to Phil and Sam shortly and they are going to take you through there's three sections to this evening's webinar there's the importance of curriculum communication and language we then move on to a curriculum for communication and language and what does that mean what does that look like and then let's spend some time thinking about making progress through knowing more and remembering more and what does that mean but before we do that i'd firstly just like to um, pause for a moment and just to say thank you. And our Chief Inspector, um, Amanda Spielman, has recently been um, at various conferences and in the media. She's made it really clear and wanted to make sure that we gave thanks to all of you for all that you've been doing for our youngest children and all your dedication and hard work. And in recognition of this, in April, we published our new strategy and reflecting on just how important a good early education is, we've chosen to have a specific strategic focus on the early years for the next five years. We think that this is an area of our work in which we can have the most impact. We've done curriculum reviews in schools, for example, and they've helped develop conceptions of high quality education in different subjects. And with um, working with the curriculum unit, um, where Phil's part of, we want to make sure that we can um, do a similar thing, a similar level of evidence for, for early years. Um, and we hope that our strategy gives more prominence to early years in our work and helps providers, practitioners um, improve as well. OK, so we're going to move on to start the session, the first section of the session. So if we can just move to the next slide, Phil. OK, and as we do this, in order to help the pool on Wi-Fi and broadband and everything, if we can just turn our cameras off, colleagues, and then what we can do is put our cameras back on when we come to questions at the end. And I'm going to hand over to Phil. Thanks, Wendy. Right, so good evening everyone. I'm really pleased that you could join us and um, come on this rather, I don't know what it's like where you are, but it's cold and damp here. So it's quite nice to talk about young children and what they'll be learning. And um, as Wendy said, we're gonna be looking at communication and language. And we're gonna start off by talking about why it's so important. Then we'll look at um, the curriculum and how it's sort of delivered. And then we'll think about how we might look for progress or look at progress. When we think about um, language and communication, one of the first things that is really clear is that there's a wide variation in the, the vocabulary that young children have and they're exposed to um, in the early years. And it's really important that we take that into account. 
So there have been various different studies that have been done over the past sort of 20 or 30 years, looking at the number of words that children come across or come into contact with by the time they're about four and a half. And the, the different studies sort of find different numbers. Um, some of them find like tens of millions, some of them only find four million, but basically they all show that children who could be exactly the same age, one child might have heard millions more words than the other child beside them. And we've got to think about that carefully because we talk a lot about disadvantage, but sometimes we don't think about what the advantage is that those disadvantaged children don't enjoy. And often it will come back to this exposure to vocabulary. So that child who's heard millions more words, not only will they understand more of the words that are going on around them, but also, even though the brain isn't a muscle, it sort of works a little bit like a muscle, that because the child has had all of those, those more words going on, they've developed faster processing speeds. So they can understand more of the words that they come across, and they can also understand them at a faster rate. So basically, you know, at the rate of the adults speak, which is quite quick. So they've got a double advantage, those children. Not only do they come in understanding many more of the words that an adult says, but they can also pick them up much more quickly. And now that child who's got all of those more words, they're, they're not more intelligent. They've not got some sort of genetic advantage there. They're simply lucky that what's happened is that they've been in a, in a home, they've been in a place where they've heard lots of words. Um, and we need to know also that that's not simply just going to impact on what they can say and what they can understand, but it's actually what they know as well. Because as young children, and we develop our vocabulary. That's how we name and remember things. And I'm going to sort of give you a, a bit of an example of that now um, by talking to you about how that works and that how we, as when we were young as well, learn concepts from examples. We call it prototype theory. Um, and it's quite a complicated thing, and I'm not very good at explaining it, so I'm going to show it to you instead. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach you a concept by giving you lots of examples. And the concept I'm going to give you, or I'm going to teach you this evening, is gigage, okay, which is a Cherokee word, and it's a word for a concept. And I'm going to show you a series of pictures, and I'm fairly certain that by the time you've seen enough, you'll learn what gigage is, okay. So this first picture shows you this is gigage. This next picture, as it appears, is not gigage, but this next one here is also not gigagay. And the one that's now appearing in front of you is gigagay. As is this next one, gigagay. But this is not gigagay. And here's your last picture coming up. This one is gigagay. Now, if we were in a big room, I'd be asking you to call out and tell me what you think. And I'm fairly certain that you all have learnt that through looking at these examples, gigagay is red, okay? It's simply the color red. Now, as you went through those examples, you might have thought red when you saw that very first picture of an apple, but you might equally have thought fruit, food, round, growing, you know, who knows what it could have been. There were, a, there were a, a large number of potential things. It was as you saw the examples that you were able to narrow down your understanding of this concept. By the time you saw the dragons, you probably thought you knew what it was. But then by the time you get to this picture, this is usually the point where people are confident enough and they feel that they know what gigage means. And that, if we go back to those two children who've heard different numbers of words, that difference between thinking and knowing is also where they'll be with those words. So those children who've heard millions of words because of course it's not that they've heard a million different words if they'll have heard the same word over and over and over again going through this process they'll have a really really secure understanding of what that word means and they'll have stored that concept they'll have named that concept of red or gigage whichever way we're doing it and that will be stored in their mind and when they're asked to pick up the red pen or find the red ball they will know immediately what it is. They won't have any hesitation there because they'll know what that word means. Of course, the child who hasn't heard the words as many times 
is somewhere between the pears and the dragons in that sort of scale here of, of the giga gear that we were just looking at. They think they probably know what it is, but they're not going to be 100% certain, or it might be something where they're really not sure. So they're not going to be in the same position as that child who's able to confidently know what that word means. And it's really important that we consider this because vocabulary size relates really strongly to academic success. Um, it's probably the strongest correlation that we've got in education is that correlation between vocabulary size when you're about four and a half and you, the likelihood of you doing well later on. So, you know, there are studies that have shown that um, a poorer vocabulary when you're four and a half means you're less likely to do well in your assessments at the end of primary school, but also you're twice as likely to be unemployed by the time you're 34. You know, we talk about the long term impact and the long term importance of early years and, and early education particularly but we don't always have the numbers to back it up and I think this is a really good thing to remember you know that just simply that that measure of vocabulary size for a four and a half year old you know a child with a stronger vocabulary is more likely to be working when they're older so which is a really important thing for us to bear in mind um, so that's why we really need to focus on communication and language for our youngest children because it's so important in what they go on to later on and it also gives them the confidence and the knowledge that they need to be able to go and do more challenging activities you know that child who you know we ask the child to go and pick up the red ball and go and play that game over there if they're the child who knows what the red ball is because they know red they know ball they can just pick it up and go they can worry about playing the game the child who's not sure will be thinking, well, which which one is it? You know, I think it's that one, but I'm not sure. And that hesitation will get in the way of the other things that they want to do later on. So one of the important things to remember always is the importance of, of focusing and developing a children's spoken language, what they hear and what they can say. So how does that happen? Well, developing children's spoken language happens through the quality and the quantity of interactions that they have with adults because of course they're learning this language from the adults. Um, all babies who are born into um, places with a spoken language will learn that spoken language. They're sort of pre-programmed almost to learn and understand that language. It's not the same for things like maths that you know they won't automatically learn maths but they will automatically learn a spoken language and they're you know they're constantly seeking that um, that understanding of it. So we need to think about the quality and quantity of interaction. So those, that advantaged child, that child who comes with all of those words and all of that knowledge, have enjoyed that quality and quantity of interactions. Basically, they've come from a chatty family, haven't they? They've come from a place where people spend time talking to them, listening to them, probably you know sharing stories and singing songs or whatever. They're coming from that environment. And that gives those children an advantage. And it means that they will understand more about what's going on around them because they understand the language that's being used. And not only will they understand the individual words, they'll be much more familiar with the ways that we put words together to make sense, you know, questions, statements, stories, all of these different things. And the last bullet point on this um, is really important here, that we need to recognize those children because children who begin with a poor understanding of language are gonna need support to develop that spoken language um, and probably a bit of extra help in that you know perhaps if they haven't had all of that um, extended opportunity to to speak with adults and to listen to adults perhaps that's what they're going to need more so than the children who've had that now just um, to finish this off we've got some um, educational research that I'm going to hand over to Sam just to give you a little bit of an update on over to you Sam Thanks, Phil. Um, so I'm just going to run through some of the main findings um, from our inspection since we returned following the national lockdowns. And there have been numerous reports and research that's been undertaken in the early years sector over the course of the pandemic, as well as our own education recovery research. And we published that over the last year. And we can draw um, from that research and our own research to understand the impact of the pandemic on children's learning and development. But I think it's important that we remind ourselves that children aged two years have spent almost 80% of their life in the pandemic. 
providers, um, and that includes childminders, have shared with us that they're particularly concerned that children are behind in their prime areas of learning. There's some indication that the language and communication skills of children born during the pandemic weren't as strong as those born pre-pandemic at the same age. And providers reported that some babies have struggled to respond to basic facial expressions, which might be due to reduced contact and interaction with others during the pandemic. If we think about it, some children will have been surrounded by adults wearing masks for their whole lives and have therefore been unable to see lip movements or mouth shapes as regularly. We're told that there are ongoing delays in children's speech and language development, which could be due to them having missed out on hearing stories, singing, having conversations. And providers say they've noticed that some children have limited vocabulary or lack the confidence to speak. Some have started to speak in accents and voices that resemble the material that they've watched during the pandemic and that delays in children's speech and language development have led them to not socialise with other children as readily as they would have expected previously. We also know that children needing additional support have had to wait longer for external services such as speech and language therapists. And um, from what you've been telling us, lockdowns, restrictions and reduced socialisation such as the availability of parent and toddler groups have resulted in some children having a lack of interaction beyond their close family. And as a result, some of the youngest children have really struggled with their social skills and to settle with unfamiliar people. Some are shy, shyer, some are quieter, some feel overwhelmed in larger groups and some lack the confidence and are more shy in their settings such as when taking part in group activities. Their social and friendship building skills have been affected and they need more support with sharing and turn taking. Providers have reported regression in children's independence and self-care self skills. For example, children needing more help to put their coats on and blowing their noses and fewer children having learned to use a toilet independently. And they also said that there continues to be an impact on children's physical development, such as delays in babies learning to crawl and walk. We know there are also concerns, including from the government, about childhood obesity and dental health. But I think it's also important to say that actually some children benefited greatly from the time they spent and the interactions they had with their families during the pandemic. Thanks, Sam. And it's, I mean, it's really important to remember that all of these, you know, that, that within this group of children who've been affected by COVID, some of them will have, you know, longer term implications, if you like. It'll be more difficult for them to catch up. But one thing to think while, when if you're coming across children who have got some of these you know, these difficulties is to think rather than thinking, oh, they've got a problem which could become a special need, is to think, oh, they haven't learned to do that yet. Because if you think about it in that way, it's more, more helpful for you and for the child. So if you've got one of those children who is not speaking, you know, they're coming in at an age where they're just, and you don't think they're speaking as much as you would have anticipated they were perhaps pre-pandemic. If you think back to that stuff you know, that we've been talking about before about the high quality interactions and you do you know you work on that that can only help it can't make anything worse so if you sort of take that um use that sort of thought process of oh, they haven't learned to do that yet that you'll find much more useful in how you're going to work out how you're going to help that child i mean we know we speak to people a lot who say that they have to wait a long time for a speech and language therapist appointment um and in the in the sort of an, in the meantime whilst waiting for that appointment or even if you can't get one by trying these other things you're more likely to get that child to move forward and if that's not helping the child to move forward then when eventually they do see a speech and language therapist you will know so much more about what they can and can't do so that sort of approach would can only help anyway let's move on to the next section now which is where we're going to think more about the curriculum um, for language and communication and we've got a definition of curriculum that we um, introduced when we started this new inspection framework in September 2019, which is very much about the, the any a curriculum is simply a way of planning how you're going to get your child from where they are when they arrive with you to where you want them to be when they leave. So thinking about the steps that they're going to have to go through. And we think of it as a sort of progression model. You know, that if they're here, this is what I want them to do next so that they can take these steps to get to where I want them to be by the time they leave me. Um, and thinking about the steps, you know, the steps have got to be small enough to be achievable for those children, haven't it? So it's not great, you know, it doesn't make it too impossible for some children to achieve. Um, now, when we think about spoken language or 
language and you know communication and, and um, language in the EYFS. It's clear, and this is a direct quote from the EYFS since it was revised in 2021, that the development of children's spoken language underpins all seven areas of learning. And that's because you know, children in the early years can't read and write, and we can't expect them to be able to. The way that they communicate and pick up information is by speaking and listening. It's not anything else. And so language and communication becomes vital for all areas of learning. So when we're thinking about communication and language, we do think about it across everything. You know, those, um, you know, we think about sort of meaningful interactions. Well, that's about whatever's going on in front of that child. Now, on the next slide here, I've just broken down that educational program for communication and language into, I've just bullet pointed it really. And I just wanted to go through it with you to see, I mean, it's not, it doesn't sort of, it's not a deliberate sort of progression, if you like, but it does show you when you break it down in this way, the, the way it's developing. So, you know, back and forth interactions and conversations, we can say that with our very youngest babies where you're, there doesn't have to be real words in there, does it, to be developing that back and forth interaction and those quality of relationships that you're building. Conversations, again, whether they've got words or not, there are conversations going on that are developing that back and forth with those with those little babies. And as they grow older, it's new vocabulary, learning single words, we'll then be able to put them together. And then there's frequent exposure to books and extensive occasions to use and embed new words. Now, books feature quite heavily, and we'll talk quite a lot about books and rhymes and songs, because they teach an awful lot. They give children an awful lot of um, stuff, knowledge about language and communication, you know, because they in inevitably involve more complicated words and more complicated structures. But we will come on to that in a moment. The one that I want to just think about for a moment is the bottom one here. And this is the one that we think is least often focused on, perhaps when we're when when we're out looking at providers and provision. And it's the opportunity that children have to become comfortable using a rich range of vocabulary and language structures. So it's saying taking on from the conversations and the new vocabulary, it's actually then about doing more complicated things as those children get older. So now it's sort of for three and four year olds being able to talk about what they did or what they're going to do, how they feel about something or telling you a story or retelling you a story or telling their mum what they did today, all of those more complicated things and that require more vocabulary and also require us as children or as adults to put them together in a different way. And we think sometimes that's not given enough attention because people move into literacy and they start to think they've got to be doing phonics or helping children to write their name and things like that. But in the grand scheme of things, it's much more important that children get these opportunities to use and hear this range of vocabulary and language structures than it is to start doing anything around phonics or, or writing. Phonics and writing happen, uh, really the whole literacy sort of area of learning is most of it is actually focusing in working schools. You now it's when children get into reception that they'll start to learn their phonics. There is no need for them to be doing phonics beforehand. Um, and when we're inspecting, we won't be looking and we won't expect to see phonics, but we will be looking for these opportunities that children get to become comfortable using a rich range of vocabulary and language structures. And that doesn't just mean that they're being expected to do it. They need to hear it. They need to hear things being said that are more complicated and in more complicated ways. So it's you modeling that for those children. You know, you narrating what's going on or describing what you're doing or telling them about something they're going to do or that they did or telling them a story. All of these things really helps children to develop that deeper knowledge of how language works and how their language works that when they come on to read and write is going to be really important for them. But it's that that still communication and language which are the key here. Now I'm going to hand over to Sam now who's going to just Hopefully, Sam, give you give us a bit of an example of the sort of stuff that you might see on inspection. Yes, yeah, so I popped this slide in as an example of the type of activity and interaction that I've seen in childminder inspections. And in my experience of inspection, the quality and quantity of interactions with children is something that I think childminders are particularly good at. They constantly narrate what they and the children are doing, and they involve children in conversations as they're walking to the park or on the pickup of older children from school. And where this is done particularly well is when childminders are using those routine activities to increase children's vocabulary, as you've just said, Phil. 
So they'll be talking about what they see and hear as they're shopping, teaching them about road safety, for example, helping them to manage risks. And in their homes, childminders will use games with babies and toddlers, such as peekaboo, um, like there are in this slide. To, they're supporting their PSED, but actually they're also really valuing their attempts at speaking, adding in new words and demonstrating language structures. So it might seem simple, but in this example, a baby who's just learning to talk may say gone or something that is supposed to be gone. And the childminder says, where has Effie gone? There she is. She's hiding under the yellow scarf. And this kind of interaction is what we want to see on inspection. We want to see childminders routinely reading to children, talking to them, listening to them, singing songs, increasing their vocabulary and knowledge. Lovely, thanks Sam. We, and it's also worth um, saying there as well that of course when we look at when we're looking at communication and language on inspection we can't separate it out from anything else so you know, one of the fundamental things in PSED is about those those attachments that are built, the relationships, the quality of relationship between the adults and the children. And you think about, from our point of view, I'm sure from yours as well, we find it difficult to separate out that early work around conversation um, and attention given to children and the, you know the interest in them. With we, you can't separate it out from that development of the the attachments at that very early stage. So it's really fundamental stuff here. One thing that's worth thinking about and you might be interested in now is the um, you know, the sort of things that we would be looking for when on inspection. And I've got a little bit of a, a list here of things that are in the handbook that we would be looking for. Um, you know, we're looking to see um, child mind is engaging in a dialogue with children. Um, watching, listening and responding. The listening is so important, isn't it? But also that next point, they're modelling language well because they learn those new words and those new ways of speaking from the examples they hear around them. So you need to be giving them examples that they don't know themselves so that you're spreading that knowledge. It's really worth, you know, there are, there are some things that we learn that you have to learn in a sequence. You know, you have to learn number one before you learn number two. But it's not the case when we look at vocabulary, new words. There is no rule that says that you can't say Tyrannosaurus rex before you've learned the word dog. It's not how it works. You can just simply you know, find lots and lots of different language and it's in a vocabulary. It's all about the, that, those words being used in a context. That's what's important, is that the words are meaningful to the child in the situation that they're in. Then we can see what the other things on our list, you know, encouraging children to sing songs and nursery rhymes, encouraging children to use new words and supporting independence and confidence. You know, a whole range of things there that we, we think most childminders do as routine practice, but we really want, I suppose really, just to let you know how important it is and that, that we know it's important as well. So not for you to underestimate the importance of it and also to know that we also think it's important. So when we start thinking about a curriculum, for communication and language, you know, and, I, and I've sort of said already, you know, a curriculum is that, that way that you do the planning. And also I will just point out that for us, planning doesn't mean a piece of paper. Planning is the activity that goes on in your brain, you know, how you want to get your children to the place that you want them to do. We're not expecting to see any piece of paper or anything written down, um, but we will want to hear it. You know, we'll want to know what you think of where this child is and what you're doing to get them to where they need to be. But anyway, here we go. So this is the, when we look at that communication and language um, curriculum, you know, or the area for learning that's, that's um, set down in the EYFS, we can see it's, there's a couple of aims there, sort of when you boil it down. First of all, is that children have the chance to build vocabulary and language structures, and then that they can use those new vocabulary and language structures. And the two ways that that's going to happen is through interactions and also through stories, rhymes and songs. And I'm going to deal with those two things. But before I do, I just want to sort of a, a bit of a, a bit, I suppose, of a health warning, really. And it's about the activities. Um, activities aren't a substitute for knowing what you want children to learn and then thinking about where they are. It's not, the, the activity isn't a substitute for the curriculum. Um, and sometimes what happens is that we try and work to come up with more exciting or attractive activities. 
But the trouble is activities, unless we know what we want children to learn, activities can just sort of be rather large and not necessarily get across what we need children to learn. So our advice always is that if you, that you need to think about what you want children to learn before you plan the activities, because otherwise you're putting the cart before the horse. So thinking about that sort of that idea of the curriculum, knowing what you want children to learn, then makes it easier to decide how you're going to do that. Or, you know, we've got a picture of a mud kitchen up here. The mud kitchen on its own is not enough. You know, it's, we could go to two different places with exactly the same mud kitchen, if you've got a mud kitchen, I don't know. But say we went to two places with the same mud kitchen, in one place we might be seeing children learning loads of new words and new vocabulary, having all sorts of chances to say complicated things, and in another, we might not see any of that. And that's because it's not the mud kitchen. You know, if um, you found yourself with one of the children that you look after, and you were in a room where there was no toys whatsoever, and you had to sort of entertain and, and educate that child for a while, you would find some of the stuff that was around you and, and make use of it, wouldn't you? It's not the stuff which is the difference, it's you that makes the difference. Um, it's the interaction and it's what you're doing. So that's why when we're thinking about activities, think about what you want the children to learn and then think about how you might use that activity to do that thing. So let's go on anyway into just thinking about high quality interactions. Um, and a lot of this comes down to the quality of conversation that's going on all the time. The EYFS talks about a language rich environment. And sometimes people mistakenly think that means that you've got things labeled, you know, you've got laminated labels on everything so that there's a word everywhere. But as I said earlier on, you know, young children can't read and write so they they're not going to they're not going to benefit from those labels and that's also not fundamentally what a language rich environment is a language rich environment is a chatty environment it's one where adults are talking to children and engaging them in conversations almost all the time now we're not talking about talking people to death but that's what that language rich environment is and we've actually we've got a definition of teaching in our in our handbook um, and, and our definition of teaching describes all the sort of interactions. It talks about communicating and modeling language, showing, explaining, demonstrating, it's exploring ideas, it's encouraging, questioning, recalling, or providing a narrative for what children are doing, it's facilitating and setting challenges. So all of those things, which are you know, a part of our definition of teaching. So when we're coming in and we're looking at what adults are doing with children, what you're doing with children, that's the sort of big range of activities that we would put underneath that heading of teaching. So that is about the quality of chat that's going on. Um, and that's what those children need. So as I said earlier on, um, we've got these sort of two parts of um, the curriculum. We've got the building the language structures and then we've got providing opportunities. Um, for children to actually engage with them. And it's really important that we remember when we think about interactions, that not all children come in, as I said at the beginning, with the same level of vocabulary. And also not all children are as happy to chat as others. Um, you know, if, if we were in a big room together, and I asked you all a question that you would all have an answer to, you know, say I ask you your favorite TV program. Um, many of you would be very happy to share to say that in the room. Others of you won't. You'd rather tell me when we're having a coffee. And that's not because, um, you know, some of you are less sure of your answer. It's actually just because some people are more comfortable talking in a large group than others. And it's the same with children, isn't it? We know that some children are much happier to come and tell you or anybody else what's going on and some children will be quieter. What's really important is that we don't misinterpret that quietness um, and we need to know that if we've got quiet children that either they are able to answer our questions, they do know what's going on, they're just quiet, in which case we talk to them quietly, or we need to work out that the reason they're not saying it out in the 
in the environment with others is because they're not actually a certain because if we find that there are children who who have got gaps in their knowledge of speaking you know if they don't know as many words as others then we need to help them to build that so it's a so important that you know you spend time getting to those children understanding what they do and don't understand um then when we come on to thinking about stories and rhymes and songs um it's a really really important vehicle for language and language structures you think about any story or rhyme that you use regularly they will have words that we don't often use you know um Think about going on a bear hunt and you've got all the swishy swishy all of those words they're not words that children will routinely come across also anything with a bit of rhyme in it is automatically going to have a more interesting structure and is going to use more interesting words you know if i don't know if you've ever tried to write a rhyme for somebody's um, birthday or whatever but you very quickly realize that it's difficult to find words that rhyme with each other once you get past the very straightforward ones so julia donaldson to make those work those books rhyme and to flow she spent a long time choosing the words so as soon as you've got um, one of those a, a book like that you're automatically giving those children richer language language that they won't come across themselves and it's really important when you're reading to them that you read things to them that they can't read themselves and it, you know the vast majority of children at this age won't be able to read anything so you give them a really good book that they can get hooked into it's the same for the rhymes and the songs. You're giving them a really rich bit of language. And never underestimate the importance of it. And particularly when we're coming in, don't think that there are other things that we're going to want to see more than that. You know, we would, from our point of view, often when you're telling, telling children stories or singing songs or rhymes with them, it's probably one of the richest pieces of work in the day for that child because they're getting so much out of it they're getting that relationship with you they're linking it in learning all this stuff about vocabulary but also really importantly you want them to enjoy stories it's really important that we try to get all of our children to enjoy stories because it's the enjoyment of stories which will carry them through learning to read because learning to read can be difficult you know it's not a straightforward process for children it's a bit like learning to drive nobody learn goes for driving lessons because they love the lessons the reason people take driving lessons is because they've got their eye on the prize the prize of the independence and the opportunities that comes from being able to drive so that's the prize so you put up with the lessons and if you're like me you put up with lots and you do a couple of tests as well but you put up with that because you want the prize you want that independence that comes with driving and if you can give your children a love of stories and rhymes and songs that gives them the prize because they will want to read them themselves when they get older and that will carry them through that more difficult time when they learn to read themselves so you you know don't underestimate the importance of that time that you spend with children really getting them to love the stories and the rhymes and the songs it's also just worth bearing in mind that you'll you could have children who've come in who've had stories you know read to them from the moment they were born and you'll other children have children who haven't and if those children who haven't had that experience they'll be in a different starting place and you just need to work from where they are they probably won't be as able to sit down and listen for an extended period of time as another child so you know work just remember that you know we sort of start where they are and that's what we'd want you to do with your curriculum is start where the children are and then see where you want them to get to right the next slide this is really just going back to my um my thing about the activities i want to just bear bear with me for a moment while i tell you a story okay and it, hopefully it'll make sense as we go through this imagine that we are stood outside a very large empty supermarket it's empty of people but it's full of food and stuff um, and we've got let's have five three-year-olds okay and we explain to these five three-year-olds that what we'd like to do is go into the supermarket find us bread and eggs and then come and bring it back to us so we set them off they um, you know, the doors open they walk through and we see them wandering up through the fruit and base they turn the corner and they disappear and then we wait and we wait for quite a long time and after perhaps an hour two children appear both clutching bread and eggs and they come back to us and we're very very pleased 
and then we wait for a while longer and perhaps even a bit longer and then two more children appear they haven't got bread and eggs but by this stage in the day we're very very pleased that they've come back to us and the last child we don't actually see but they don't come out of that supermarket but don't worry this isn't a real supermarket it's not real children i'm just trying to illustrate a point here so what i want you to think about now is that imagine that this this supermarket is actually my activity this is the activity that i've planned and i've crammed it with stuff but the learning that I want children to come out of my activity with is the bread and the eggs, okay? So the first two children that came out, came out of this activity with bread and eggs, the second two didn't, and the, the, the last child we sort of lost. But, but inside my supermarket, I get these two things. Now the first child that's come out and brought those bread and eggs to me, the reason that they can do that is because they've been to this supermarket before. They know where everything is because they come with their granny every Saturday morning and their granny gets them to pick stuff up and do it. And so this child knows exactly where everything is in the supermarket. They know what bread is and what eggs are and they were able to find them and they were able to get their own way out. OK, so they look like they've got the learning that we wanted, but actually they haven't gained that learning because they actually knew that already. So before they went into this activity, they knew this stuff and so they were able to successfully get what we wanted out of it. The second child, who also came back with bread and eggs, didn't actually know this supermarket at all. They'd never been to this supermarket before. They don't really go to supermarkets either. And they don't really know what bread and eggs are. But they are very good friends with the first child and they stayed with the first child. And when their friend, who was the first child, said, pick this up and carry it, they did. So that child hasn't learned what we really wanted them to from this activity. It looks like they have, but they haven't. But they have earned a very important lesson about education, which is to stay with that friend. You know, um, to have a friend in school who you can get some help from is very, very useful. I can't be the only person who used that strategy and actually still use that strategy, having good friends around me who can help me at work. So then we look at those next two children who didn't come out with bread and eggs. Now they sort of knew a bit about supermarkets because they've been to other supermarkets before. And basically what they knew was if you just keep on going in a supermarket, eventually you will get out. Um, and no matter how big it is, you just keep wandering up and down those aisles, eventually you'll find an exit. And that's what they did. So they got out, they didn't get the learning that we wanted them to, but they did sort of get out of that activity. And what they learned was that the activity was very complicated and that they had to just keep on going. The last child, the one that didn't come back, probably found something interesting in the supermarket and stayed because they didn't know enough about any of the sort of rules of this activity to actually be able to come out with any sort of learning. And they're probably the ones that we should be most worried about because they didn't have any other knowledge. So hopefully it's starting to sort of be clear that what I'm trying to suggest is that sometimes activities can be rather like this supermarket. Sometimes an activity can have so much potential learning in it that it's very difficult for those children to get any learning out of it because it's so so big and complicated to negotiate. And sometimes the only children who get stuff out of those complicated activities are the ones who can do it already. Um, and the only way sometimes other children can, can finish the activity is by having a lot of help from adults. And that's because the activity contained too much. The activity was just too difficult for those children to be able to achieve. And that's where we sort of come back to our some of the key messages that I'm sort of giving you. First of all, about, you know, not knowing what children know. So we don't give them things that are far too complicated for them to be able to achieve. But also thinking about the curriculum. Say we actually thought it was an important thing for three year olds to be able to go into a supermarket, find bread and eggs and bring it out. And I'm not suggesting that it is at all, but say it was. What we'll do is we'll break that down and we'll build that into the curriculum. So what we'll say is one of the, the things that we want our children to be able to do is achieve this by the time they leave me. So what I'm going to do is break this down. And I'm going to break it down to its parts. So I'm going to first of all, I'm going to start with getting children to really know what eggs are. We'll do a bit of work around eggs. We'll, you know, we'll feel eggs. We'll break eggs. We might make something. We might do some baking with eggs. We might talk about eggs. I might find a book with some eggs in it and some stories. 
then we'll move on to bread and we might break, make some bread or play with some bread or eat some bread or just talk about bread. But I'm going to make sure that children know what these things are. Then I might take them to the supermarket and let them to walk through the supermarket and I'll show them where things are. So what you do is you incrementally build it so that in the end they can do this complicated task and they can all do it. Because the children who didn't know what bread was get that help. They learn what it is. The child who already knew it is getting that sort of they can learn more can't they even more language about bread more talk more broadly about it but you make sure that everybody has the knowledge they need to complete this more complicated activity so we talked about the curriculum and what i just want to do here before i let um sort of sam tell you what a curriculum is is i just want to say again what's what the curriculum isn't a curriculum isn't the same as the teaching or the pedagogy you know the way that you're getting stuff across the curriculum is deciding what you want children to learn or what you want to get taught, not how you're going to do it. So it's very much when you're doing your curriculum thinking, you think, what do I want these children to learn? And once you've decided that, it becomes much easier to then plan the activities um, about how you're going to get that across. The curriculum isn't the same as providing experiences that my supermarket was an experience. And the trouble with experiences sometimes is that if you think about those five children, they all went into the same experience, but they all came out with different things. They didn't all get the same learning from that experience. They need much. We need to know what they know already. And sometimes experiences, just simply experiencing something isn't enough, particularly for those children who don't have the same advantages as others. The curriculum isn't about thinking about more elaborate and creative activities. You know, sometimes simple is best. Now, I was on inspection some time ago, and I, before I went in to see a lesson, and this was in a school where they had a, um, a, a three-year-old class, you know, a nursery class. They explained to me the group that I was going to see were a group of children who were struggling with using scissors and cutting. And I went to watch the activity, and it was a really complicated activity about making um, Chinese New Year puppets out of paper plates. And there was very little cutting going on. I think what actually those children learned most was to follow the instructions of the adult who was leading the activity. But those children came out, I think, probably with less, with, with worse cutting skills than when they went in. Because actually, it was there was too much going on there. And so the learning was lost. Whereas actually what those children needed, they first of all needed somebody to show them how to cut. You know, their elbows were up in the air. They were doing the scissors on the side. They needed somebody to say, tuck your elbow in, hold the scissors like this. Let me show you how to do it. Now, here's a nice big piece of paper. Can you cut it up for me? They needed something much more straightforward. And in, in a quite a short period of time, that those children would have improved their cutting because there was a bit of focus there. Whereas what was going on with this activity was it was probably, um, you know, meaning that those children's cutting was going to get worse good curriculum it should be proactive we should be thinking ahead um, we need to think about the sequence you know what do we want children to learn where do we want them to get to in the end and then how do we break that down into a sequence that actually works for them and then we need to make sure that all children are ready so even those children who have got who don't know as much as others how can we help them to make the same progress and it might mean that we need to give them a bit of extra we need to make them we, so we make progress through knowing more and remembering more. That's Ofsted's definition of progress. It comes to our understanding about how we learn and how we acquire knowledge. And we're not, you no know, children, we as people are not empty buckets into which bits of knowledge are dropped. It's actually much more complicated than that. It's much more about making links between things. You know, we learn to think how things are similar and how things are different. It's why similarities and differences um, are so important when we're talking to children about anything you know think back to the the giga j stuff that i did with you earlier on that's what you were doing you were looking at how it was similar and how it was different and you're working out what that giga j meant um so when we're looking at, at learning we would say that um learning is an alteration in long-term memory if children haven't remembered it in their long-term memory it's not been learned you know we can all remember how to do something in the short term you know, show me something today and I can probably do it today. But if you want me to learn it in the long term, I've got to practice it. And there's got to be a plan about how you know, we keep that going. Um, when we think about how children learn, I said earlier on about 
language and vocabulary we do that um, my pictures here are, are supposed to help so there's a supposedly a fruit salad on one side although i'm never quite sure where it's got a cabbage in it but anyway it's a fruit salad if i ask you to go and make a fruit salad your fruit salad might look very different to somebody else's but it would be fundamentally the same it would be fruit okay so in some areas of learning you just accumulate it doesn't matter there's no sort of prescriptive list so with vocabulary you know children can learn the vocabulary they learn they can accumulate that they get their own sort of fruit salad of vocabulary it doesn't have to be exactly the same as everyone else's so there's no sequence in which it has to be taught whereas other things rather like my jenga block there is a sequence if we're doing number you need to do number one before you do number two because otherwise you're not going to get that sequence it's not going to make as much sense so when we're thinking about um what inspectors will be looking to see when they're with child minders sam do you want to help me out here a bit tell me a bit um, about what we'll be looking for Yes, I'm happy to. Um, but before I do that, I just wanted to give you an example of, of an inspection that I did recently and um, thinking about that cumulative knowledge. And it was just so evident that the child mind had talked to children routinely. She thought about what she wanted children to know and was also she was genuinely interested in the children's experiences and their thoughts. Um, she was always checking in with their feelings and, and their own ideas. And it was so obvious that they enjoyed each other's company. And I didn't really need to ask the childminder any questions about her curriculum for communication and language because I got all the evidence I needed from watching their interactions. And I tracked the experiences of a, a two year old child who told me about the pizzas that she'd made with the childminder a few days before the inspection. And at that point, the childminder didn't know that her inspection was happening. So I already knew that these things happen routinely at the setting. And the child could tell me about the ingredients they'd used and the childminder was talking to her about her family members, her friends and what she knew about her experiences outside of her setting. And then at snack time, they were sitting in the garden and some magpies started chattering in the garden. And the childminder asked the child if she could hear them. And the child then asked if the babies were in the nest. So I knew the childminder had spoken to her about the magpies before. And it wasn't just because I was there. And then um, she very skillfully captured the child in, child's interest by reading her stories from books that the child particularly enjoyed. And then when she had her hooked, she hooked her with these um, seashells that related to the story. She went and got them and, and brought them out for her. Then she introduced less familiar books um, with the child and that introduced new words and concepts and supported the child's growing understanding of diversity. She also used rhymes that the children enjoyed such as Incy Wincy Spider, and that supported children's growing knowledge of number. And the two-year-old, um, she was then telling me that the spider puppet had lost one of his eight legs and they hadn't been able to find it. And just as you said, Phil, um, that we don't look at communication or PSED, for example, in isolation, we also don't gather evidence for quality of education in isolation. So although I was, fo um, I was focusing on communication and language development, which we are required to do in our inspections, I was also gathering a lot of evidence for personal development, behaviour and attitudes and leadership and management from my observations of these interactions and routine activities. But um, in terms of the, um, the slide, and as Wendy said at the beginning, we're sharing with you, um, you exactly what inspectors are asked to do. Everything they're asked to do is also in the inspection handbook, which is why we always refer you to the handbook when we make the notification call to tell you that your inspection is happening. And if it's been a while since you last looked at it, I'd really recommend that you do, especially as there's now a specific section for childminders. And the points on the slide are just some examples of what inspectors will look to see is happening. And again, you might recognise that all of the points on the slide um, appear in paragraph 100 of the handbook. That's great. Thanks, Sam. We hear some lovely stuff about what goes on in um, childminders and nurseries. It's always nice to, to hear about those those good examples. Um, so I'm just going to very quickly finish off before I hand back to, to Wendy um, with this, my falling Jenga tower here, the dangers of missing knowledge. We talk about the foundation stage and it's called that for a reason. It's because it is the foundation of so much. And as I said, right at the beginning, um, you know, simply looking at the number of words that a child knows by the time they're about four and a half is a really strong indicator of how well they'll do later on. And it's, I suppose, part of the purpose of this um, 
this presentation for you is to really emphasize how important communication and language is and that we know it's important too. I know you know it's important, but don't think that you've got to do other things. Remember that a focus on communication and language is so important for all of our children, particularly those ones who aren't as advantaged as others. And by focusing on communication and language early on, we prevent the likelihood or we reduce anyway the likelihood of some of these things going wrong for children as they get older. You know, it increases the likelihood of them doing well in school and all of the things that that brings with it. Anyway, I'm going to hand you back over to um, Wendy now. I know I've spoken too long. Sometimes I spend too long sort of talking about these things, but I'll hand back over to Wendy. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Phil and Sam. And just, just before we come to um, the opportunity for questions, just some key messages here that Phil has already covered as he's gone through that presentation. So things to take away from this evening, a language rich environment is vital and a language rich environment does not refer to the physical environment and the words that are visible in the setting. It's about the interaction between yourself and the children. A language rich environment is one in which adults talk with children throughout the day. And Sam's given us some really lovely examples there of what she's seen on inspection. High quality interactions make all the difference. We know to develop and extend children's language takes careful, deliberate planning. And remembering, as Phil said, that planning is the planning in your head. We're not asking for you to write anything down in each area of learning with opportunities to build in um, plenty of repetition there. And then we learn things in different ways, taking you back to that slide with the fruit salad and the Jenga block. So there are some things that you need to learn in a sequence, the maths example that Phil gave us. And also remembering that children learn everywhere all the time. Language and communication takes place everywhere all the time. And so on inspection, we'll be looking at language and communication everywhere all the time, just as Sam set out in that example um, when we were looking at the previous slide. OK, so that takes us up to the end of um, what we wanted to share with you today. And um, if we can go to the next slide, Phil. And if we can also just then go back and put our cameras on. Because we do just have an opportunity now for um, some questions. And I think one of the things that's really good to, um, to do is it's really helpful that you've given us a huge number of questions ahead of this evening's webinar, because what we've been able to do is make sure that we've covered those things through. But there are a couple here that I think I've got one for Sam and I think I've got one for Phil. So, Sam, can I start with um, a question for you? Um, and I think you've covered this already, but I think it's worth reiterating. Will you go outside on a nature walk during an inspection if it's part of routine activity? Absolutely. Yes. Um, we want you to do whatever it is that you had planned to do, whatever it is that you would usually do. Um, you know, we, we want to see your routine activities. And if a nature walk is part of that routine activities or, or part of your curriculum, then absolutely. Yes, we'd love to come out on a, on a nature walk with you. And um, I think we actually answer that question or a similar question on our EIF and DYFS page on the Internet. Um, so if anybody have any similar think, questions, yeah. yeah, we can you can we can direct people to to that page as well, and we can also share that link with you um, after the, this um, webinar this evening. Um, and then the other one, really, I think, is um, Phil. I guess for you, if if you can just say something a little bit more about um, knowing where children are. There's been a few questions that have come in around. Um, children who speak English as an additional language, if they're bilingual children, or um, also if we've got children who are pre-verbal. And I know there's been examples all the way through what you've said today, but I think it's just good to reiterate that, that thing about knowing where children are. Yeah, and, and, it's, and people think um, sometimes sort of default to think that that's about assessment and some sort of tick sheet. 
But we really, what we're interested in is how well you know your children. Now, do you know what they do know and what they don't know? If they've, you know, if they have got English as an additional language, have they got a good vocabulary in their own language? Do you know that? Do you know if they're chatty in their own language? And are you supporting that and valuing that? And at the same time, giving them those opportunities to learn the words in English as well. Um, and it's so much of it is about context for all of those children. Um, you know, children learn language by hearing it and hearing it being used and being used with them. And that's how they're going to pick up meaning. So even for those children who are nonverbal, you know, even the conversations that you might be having with with very young babies, there are still things there where we're, we're interested in them. We're talking to them. They're going to hear those sounds. They're going to be learning a huge amount of, of things about language and communication. Um, and then you can proceed with that because the more that you know about them, the more that you can find out what they're interested in and what they like and talk to them about that as well. So it's, you know, language and communication works really well for all children. I mean, uh, what I guess we'd say is sometimes you might need to be prioritising it, making it even more important for some children where it is going to be more significant for them. Brilliant. That's really helpful. Thank you, Phil. I'm conscious of time, colleagues, and I know um, childminders listening in this evening have had really busy days, I'm sure, with, with the children that they've been um, providing um, a quality education for. So I think that just leaves us to say thank you. Thank you for what you do for our youngest children and thank you for what you continue to do and um, spending your evening with us. And thank you, Sam and Phil. Thank you all. Thanks very much.